Okay, we got some questions today, and I'm Lesage Singh, your disgruntled, disheveled voice teacher person. All right, anyway. Okay, the question is, does acid reflux affect the vocal folds, and if so, to what extent? Um, I have met singers who've had such extreme acid reflux that it has affected their ability to sing high notes, um, but that's pretty drastic amounts of damage. Um, I, there's only one singer I've ever met that's, that's happened to, and she admitted to, like, getting up in the middle of the night and eating a cheeseburger and going right back to sleep. Um, so that can happen in the extreme. And oh my God, my shaving is terrible. I love the new camera. Everything about my face that I don't like is now perfectly in high fidelity. So there's that. Anyway, um, the other concerns about acid reflux is that it can mess with the mucosal lining if the acid goes too far up and can also swell your folds. Both are temporary. If you're having issues with mucus, as in there's not enough of it, you can drink dairy, um, which will add to the mucus. If you overdo dairy and you have too much mucus, you can do uh, lime or lemon and some water, and that'll get rid of a lot of mucus. So that's how you would solve that problem. And then as far as, as the swollen folds go, you just kind of have to rest. You don't really want to sing on swollen folds. And you know you have swollen folds when you sound uh, uh, when your voice is like super deep and gravelly like that. That's usually when your folds are swollen. And acid reflux can do that. All right, hold on, next question. Oh my goodness, this is a lot of questions. All right, um, I put myself into this situation, so hold on, let me just, okay. We're gonna go with, uh, where, let's go with, uh, I'm working on air control lately. However, most of my singing louder when I go high, days I can control the volume and days I can't. What should I do to have more control over volume? Well, happy, I'm happy you ask that. <laughs> dynamic control. The first thing you have to do with dynamic, in order to have dynamic control is you have to be able to sustain that pitch comfortably with literally no effort. Um, before you can do that, you don't have really the uh, the ability to do like dynamic control in a healthy way without sort of doing some chicanery manipulation. Um, the manipulation is not worth learning. No, learn to hit the note, learn to sustain it, and then you can work on crescendo, decrescendo. The pain about this answer is that you have to work on your fundamentals. Are your vowels good? Is your breath good? And you'll know your vowels are good. If your breath is good, you can test that by putting a two fingers in front of your mouth, and you should only be feeling like a warm sensation. You shouldn't be feeling no air pressure. If you're able to accomplish that, then it's about vowels. And I would do like meow exercises for this. So you can sustain it on a meow. And the reason why meow is great is it goes through all the, all the, the different vowels in a sort of a, in a very clean way. Uh, the other thing you can do is sustain e, a, a, o, u, and make sure that none of that goes flat and all of that feels comfortable. At which point, you can suspend your rib cage to go for a softer dynamic. Um, I literally would just do crescendo, decrescendo exercises. So if my piano were working, I'd be like, ah, right? And just like bring that back and forth. Hard to tell because I have a compressor on, but um, you can get pretty loud in between things. Um, the breath, suspending the rib cage and, and like, really managing your breath really well. Um, that can help you crescendo, changing your resonance in your mouth. So like certain vowels are more resonant on different pitches. So you can experiment with that. Like, let's see. Right, like I shift it more to an I and that gives more resonance and stuff like that. I just have to worry about my tongue going back. Everyone does. So that's the answer to that question is just stronger fundamentals. And then when you actually can do it right, which is sustaining a note, and it's comfortable, and you could just do that, that's when you start working on vowels, resonance, and some, some air stuff. All right, what, what, where would I say about the range if I were to guess? So this individual is an individual, I think my camera's uneven. There we go, that's better. So this individual is someone that I've been teaching for a little bit. Um, they were one of the first very active uh, Discord members, so I know a lot about their particular voice. Um, the lesson learned here is that if you spend a lot of time in one kind of register uh, for your singing voice, you can get really good at that register, but then have trouble blending every other part of your voice. 
Um, this happened to me when I was a student in college and everyone wanted to assign me Mozart. And Mozart is difficult for most people, but it, it became kind of something I was really comfortable with. But then I never could sing my high notes and my low notes were kind of weak. I was really good at what what is common in Mozart for the tenor is that there's something called the passaggio. For me, that's E natural to A flat. I can sing for days on those notes. It's like whatever. But um, the reason why I could is that part of the range actually favors like a domed soft palate. Um, some of the air escapes when you dumb your soft palate and it's, it changes the tone in those areas, at least when you're trying to sing opera in such a way that it sounds a little bit more elegant and robust and round. Um, so I was doing that, but you like on your bottom, you want to lift it soft palate on your, on your top, you want to really lift it soft palate. And I was just having a lot of trouble doing that because that part of my range didn't require lifted soft palate. So this individual usually sings incredibly high. Um, and so I'm just answering this person's question, this particular individual struggles in what I would call the Passaggio area because um, that is an area where you can really easily go flat. It's a really tricky area. It takes a lot of people many years usually to navigate that without going flat or without strain. And so I would say that that's where that individual is having problems. They can go up super high in their falsetto, but they have a lot of trouble with the Passaggio. And the way that you have to exercise that is you really should be doing scales um, or intentionally picking your repertoire so that you're targeting these areas. But if you don't know what notes your repertoire hits, you should literally just do scales um, because you need to find out these these little parts of the range are different for every singer, even if you're a tenor, even if you, like tenors don't have the same breaks all the time as other tenors. Um, so that's something that I would work on for this individual. This one is an odd question. Uh, on, and do I have the thing? Okay. Um, can I feel my CT muscles and use them in an isolated way to stretch my for my chords as I ascend and descend notes? Okay, this is the problem that everybody like. Singing is actually not that complicated. It's just hard. And what happens with a lot of people when they feel stuck is that they look up a lot of stuff online and like, oh, like, let me learn about this topic so I feel less stuck. And the problem with that approach is like, it's like if you're trying to get good at a baseball swing or a golf swing and you're like, well, I have to rotate my psoas 90 degrees so that my QL can rotate optimally while I swing the bat in using my centrifugal force to hit the bat ball in sports ball. Do you see how that explanation is insane and not helpful at all? Like, so you're telling me you're literally going to practice your baseball swing going like, OK, my psoas needs to contract and all. no, you would never do that. That's dumb. But we do this as singers because we don't have answers and everyone, there's so much bull uh, that's out there. So can you feel your cricothyroid contracting? Maybe. Uh, everything around the voice is incredibly, 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 incredibly tiny. You're better off looking for certain different kinds of tilts and trying to feel that. So what do I mean by tilt? If you want to sing classically, your Adam's apple is the thyroid cartilage. It's larger than the cricothyroid, so it's easier to tell what's going on. When that stuff tilts, great. If you want to tilt your thyroid cartilage, that's a different sensation entirely, and that's more for belting. But if you, if you experience that tilt, that's a, those, these are larger movements. In the same way that you wouldn't like be like, oh, my psoas, let me focus on my abdominal wall when I hit this bat be bald thing because... That's a really large muscle group and it's easy to keep track of, right? So these are these are probably, particularly the thyroid cartilage, is probably the largest moving piece of the human voice when you're singing. Um, so it's this is like kind of a, a question where it's like you're focusing on the wrong things. Can I isolate my CT muscles as I ascend and descend? I would say maybe. But you'd much rather pay attention to what the actual CT, the cricothyroid muscle, actually does, which is moves these pieces of cartilage that are way bigger. So can you focus on your CT muscles? I mean, good luck. They're so tiny. That's like saying I'm going to focus on my vocal folds. But even like the vocal folds don't even have nerve endings. 
So like, what are you trying to do when you're focusing on your vocal folds? You can't feel them. You just can't do that. That's why vocal damage happens. People don't know they've damaged their voice because there's no nerve endings on the folds. These are the larger responsible muscles that are, sorry, cartilages that are required when you ascend, not necessarily when you descend, unless you're coming from like a really high place, note wise. Focus on those larger things. And this individual, I've already given a lot of exercises to accomplish that. Um, the whimper exercise, you can even see it here. That, and I can isolate that. Once I learned how to do that, I learned to isolate the thyroid tilt. So you can, and you'll be able to hear it if I do it. So you see how it went down just a little bit there? Right? That tilting stretches out the folds and elongates the vocal tract so it gives a warmer tone. And that that muscle and is not that stable, so that's what creates vibrato. So if it's straight tone, you hear the vibrato kind of kick in, you hear the richness of the sound. Um, so I would just focus on your thyroid tilt, thyroid cartilage tilt. Um, and I would focus on sustaining com notes comfortably. I would work on your vowels. I would work on your breath. These are all fundamental things. These are the things that you have to focus on. And if you're having trouble singing, the answer is usually work on your fundamentals. Vowels, breath, vowels, breath. Having more trouble, probably more vowels and more breath. It takes a long time. And, you know, you should, yes, learn to isolate your thyroid cartilage, but all the like the focus on this muscle and that muscle and this and that, you're getting too in your head, way too in your head do and learn from the doing and then when you get stuck send a recording <laughs> and then I'll, I'll tell you what's going on but don't start doing all this guesswork uh about this that and the other thing because even if you're right in feeling something like that's one very small part of a very big picture this is not a book learning subject this think of vo being a vocal athlete you have to train like an athlete you got to set up your drills you're developing a coordination not a mental understanding, unless you want to be like a voice and speech pathologist or like a vocal scientist, then go for it. But if you want to be a singer, you have to train like an athlete and athletes do drills and athletes take time to practice all this stuff. And, you know, I'm here to answer questions, uh, but it's definitely better if you just send me a recording and be like, why am I screwing up? And then I can give you a better exercise. Anyway, Discord link down below, by the way, um, I do this. Usually, this is, I think that's the first time I've made a public video about this in a while, but yeah, Discord down below. Uh, feel kind of passive as I sing up and down. My larynx always follows my scale going up and down. I don't know how to relax my chords as they generally said. Uh, kind of more of the same as the last one. Um, these, this is a question in actually three parts. Let's break that down. Uh, I kind of feel passive as I sing up and down. What does passive mean? I have no idea. No one does. Uh, because how you describe your own sensations is uniquely up to you. You have to send a recording. You have to go by the sound. I can help you when it's a sound, but when it's a, when it's a, uh, um, a subjective sensation or feeling, I can't really do much there. Um, my larynx always follows my scales going up and down. That's another different part of the question. Uh, this is a good one. This is a good question. So the larynx goes up and down according to my scale. So if I go, ah, oh God, that was garbage. Ah, right? So if you look at that, there is motion in the larynx. It's just not that much. Ah, it's very, very, very subtle. I'm more focusing on tilting as I go up. And the reason why I focus on tilting is because your larynx can kind of stay in a neutral spot and then you tilt the thyroid cartilage or the or the um cricho cricoid cartilage holy crud that took me way too long so um as any of these cartilages tilt they stretch out the folds which allows them to accept more breath pressure behind them which gives you a little bit more power than just simply raising your larynx and also because the folds become thinner from the stretching they are more able to hit high notes. Uh, you need, when you go for high notes, and this is true for any instrument, higher notes 
need to uh, oscillate faster. So the movement needs to be faster. And so in order for that to happen, they need to be thinner. So when they're thick in the lower range, you want them to be thick like that because they need to produce more power because they're, they're literally bigger oscillations and bigger waves. So they need to be bigger to actually achieve that. Then as you go up, you thin, you thin, you thin, you thin, you thin. But the problem with just thinning the folds is that your larynx will go up and up and up and up and up. And so to demonstrate what that sounds like, uh, right? I think we've all been there, uh, right? Where that reach happens, that's you just trying to raise your larynx to hit higher notes. That has a stopping point. You need to learn to tilt either the cricoid cartilage or the thyroid cartilage. Thyroid is easier and safer to learn, and I highly recommend that. Every singer that I know that's good does both. They can belt and they can do a more traditional sound. If you, if you want to be a hard mode on yourself and you want to learn to tilt your cricoid cartilage, ugh, I mean, good luck. <laughs> that stuff is hard and dangerous and it's totally possible, doable and awesome, but why make it harder on yourself? You should probably learn the other things about singing as well. Learn to tilt your thyroid cartilage. Um, no one should ever just be belting or even just doing the thyroid cartilage. Um, so that's usually what happens when people experience like their larynx following their scales is that they're not tilting. Instead, they're just sort of reaching with a higher larynx. That's not bad. It's just you're going to lose a lot of vocal power and your scale won't be even sounding. Um, so and I don't know how to relax my folds is the next part of this question. Oh, boy. Um, this is one of those things, again, where it's like, OK, what do you mean by that? Because you actually can't feel your vocal folds. You cannot do that. I don't care what you think you can feel. And this is not me being aggressive towards this student. It's a very passionate student. I'm just, in general, I get a lot of people in the comments, well, actually, no, you don't have nerve endings. You cannot feel your vocal folds. So when the question is, I feel like I can't relax my vocal folds, what are you actually saying? I don't know. I'll need a recording, right? This is one of those things where it could be so many different things that you are feeling that I can't really answer without a recording. Um, so just again, the important part of takeaway from this question, you cannot feel your vocal folds. They have no nerve endings on them. You're, you're experiencing something else. Hello, so I'm totally new here. Can someone tell me how to warm up before singing Guns N' Roses songs. Okay, so I have uh, I have a video up that says how to sing like Axl Rose. Actually, that video is not very good. That's wrong, <laughs> as I learned later. Um, the way that I was creating the really like eh sound was I was um, actually just raising my larynx, which if you raise your larynx high enough, you can get a really annoying sound. Um, but that's not what Axl Rose actually does. So why does this matter and why does this pertain to a warm up? It matters to a warm up because what you should be doing with your warm up is kind of like checking out your, where your coordination is at that day. Um, you have to, you know, in singing, you have to coordinate stuff in order to pull stuff off. So the contraction of the area epiglottic sphincter is really important. Um, so a warm up I would do is I would do me 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 me. Eh, eh. And I try to get that buzzer sound. It sounds obnoxious. But the buzzer sound and that meep meep sound will sometimes target the area epiglottic sphincter. What I would do is I'd make sure everything here is relaxed so you're not tricking yourself by just raising your larynx to get that sound. So meep meep. Uh, uh. All right, pinch my nose, make sure it's not nasal. The area epiglottic sphincter is a sphincter right here, and it's got to contract a little bit in order to get that sound. So the first part of the warm up is finding the area epiglottic sphincter. That's the first part of it. So the way you check that is, is my larynx going up? No, awesome. Am I pinching my nose and there's a sound chasing, changing? No, awesome. Okay, I found my area epiglottic sphincter. The next part of that is gonna be like very, 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 very little air is the next thing you're gonna have to build up the, the awareness of. And, that, and again, body changes every day. So you need to do this before you, uh, during your warm up before you sing. So find the area epiglottic sphincter. Okay, cool. Found the buzzy sound. Area epiglottic sphincter is really obnoxious and annoying, but we can we can play with that. We can we we can do like a little lever. Right. 
right? I can manipulate how how much it contracts. Um, opera singers do this as well. Uh, if they want to project over an orchestra, it's completely necessary. Uh, so that's a useful thing to learn, even though in isolation it sounds obnoxious. Uh, and then from there, again, very little air. Once that sphincter contracts, your ability to tolerate breath pressure goes down significantly. Uh, you cannot put a lot of air behind the area epiglottic sphincter. It will just simply be really uncomfortable or the thing will loosen up and it won't be contracted anymore. So um, from there, I wouldn't start. I would start very low. Axl Rose usually sings stuff really high, like really high. So I'd start lower, um, even if it's just like, eh, she's got eyes of the bluest skies, and if they bottom rain. And I'd try to like get that sphincter. I'd record yourself a lot and try to get that sphincter to the point where it sounds like a bite from from rock and roll singing that sometimes singers do, especially Axl Rose, where it sounds like that, but it's not like a literal buzzer on Jeopardy. Um, and just do that. And the good news is that if you can do that comfortably, chances are you're not using a lot of air, which is great because it takes much less air the higher you go up because the folds thin and they thin and they thin and they thin. And if they just take too much breath pressure, they flip into falsetto. Nothing wrong with falsetto. But if you want to sing powerfully, you have to use a lot less air, which is counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of folks. So that's how I would do that, is I would literally isolate everything one at a time. Um, and then I would try to make it all come together in the low end, because if it's not coming together in the low end, it's just not going to happen in the high end. So why would you drain yourself and shorten your practice session by trying to make high notes work that just already will not work based off of the fact that you just don't have the right coordination? Uh, once you find everything, once the area of glottic sphincter is there, once you're being able to put your you know, fingers in front of your lips and you're not feeling anything other than a slight warmth, there's no breath pressure, once it feels comfortable, yeah, sure, go up. Absolutely. I mean, we have to go up eventually, right? But it just doesn't make sense to go up prior to everything being really, really coordinated. So... Uh, I think there are some more questions here, just in a different part of the Discord. Yeah, again, if you're in my Discord, please just send recordings followed by a question, because uh, as we pointed out in some of the earlier questions, um, you know, it's people are, are trying to get the words to explain things when in reality it's the sound we're working on. So just send the sound, right? Uh, this is an interesting one, though. Uh, Jennifer Hudson, should I do an analysis on this because it's trending in the movie? Uh, that would be smart. But what's smarter is waiting until my two weeks are up at my job so I can give this everything I have. I wanted to make this video because people are struggling with their vocals and I made a promise that I would help people in my Discord. So I wanted to do that and uh, probably won't do another one until I'm really actually done with my job. Um, so that's today's video. There will be more reacts. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go spend the day with my wife and recover from my very intense work job that I love, that I'm quitting. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, until next time, happy singing. Again, y'all folks, if, you're, if you want help with your singing, come to the Discord, send a recording. Uh, I really don't, I prefer people don't direct message me. One, having a supportive community. Everyone, I've, I have never had to kick someone for being a disparaging a-hole. Uh, everyone's been really chill and supportive. Um, if anyone ever becomes like a hypercritical a-hole, they're just gone. Like, I don't, I don't tolerate that at all. So they're just going to get kicked. Um, yeah, and you can DM me if anyone gets into like a problem. I just, I do the Discord thing because I got a lot of free help when I was coming up. And without that, I wouldn't have gotten a scholarship and I wouldn't be able to go to college, yada, yada, yada. So um means a lot to me to, to, to do this and answer the questions on the Discord. Um, that's why I do it. So come on down, but send a recording because questions can get tricky, right? We're all feeling different things and we all describe that stuff different ways. So we need a common understanding. And the best way to do that is just, I can hear it when something's up. And I, like, I, I've trained for 14 years, <laughs> like... When something's up, I know I usually know exactly what it is. Like, 
I know it sounds like what and what muscle contraction or this or that or the other thing, what that sounds like. Um, very rarely am I stumped. Uh, and when I do, I, when I am stumped, I bring it to my voice and speech pathologist contact. So anyway, that's today's video. I need a haircut and a shave.